I am joined today by Leith Hampshire, who is a somatic coach. And uh, we're going to hear a lot more about what that actually means, I hope, um, as we go through this conversation. Um, Leith has actually worked and lived in numerous countries. I think it's 40 currently and counting, and um, is hugely experienced in the concept of mindset. And that is what we're going to hopefully do a deep dive into uh, in this particular episode of the podcast. Um, But I don't want to steal Leith Sunder here in terms of introducing his story. And this is is quite a unique story. So I'm really, really excited to kind of hear more about that, but also then do, as I say, this deep dive into the idea of mindset and what that can mean for your professional and personal well-being. But over to you, Leith, because I want to hear a little bit more about this story, which contains one very, very interesting moment in your life, I think. <laughs> thank you very much, Neil, for the lovely introduction. And thank you very much for having me as a guest this morning on your podcast. It's always a pleasure to be in the presence of other storytellers and be willing to share the journey of what I've been through. And it's interesting because I think when you're in when you're the character of your own journey, uh, it becomes your life. But then when someone else witnesses it, they just remind you some parts of that story and actually how interesting or adventurous that story might have been. Uh, when I kind of sometimes feel like, oh, it's just my life, but actually reminding myself that is real is a real gift, actually. So thank you very much for just, you know, pointing that out and now being here sharing. And so where do I start? Where do I begin is uh, always the big question. It's, you know, do I start when I was very young, a very young boy? I got kicked out of school when I was 16 years old. And, you know, why I mention that is because it ties well into the work that I do now with universities. And I was someone who never really enjoyed classical education. Um, Yet I went off to university in Bristol and went to study entrepreneurship. By studying entrepreneurship, it allowed me to find something that I really enjoyed doing. I found something which wasn't classical education and it allowed me to kind of shift outside the box. It allowed me to be a bit more of a free thinker and allowed me to explore more of myself. And that's kind of where I started to dip my toes into the world of mindset. I remember one of the first books I read was Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, which was a real big life changer in regards to understanding how this world is shaped. And you've got Isaac D. Walton with The Science of Success, another great book all around mindset, written 30, 40 years ago. But those books became strong pedestals for my journey and for what I was then, you know, the gift I was given with the experiences that I had, where I really had to put my mindset to a test. It was was very, you know, it's kind of like the world was like, okay, you really want to understand mindset? We're going to gift you with this opportunity to really see what you can do. Uh, And so... After university, um, as you as you've mentioned, I spent a long time traveling, um, primarily actually through um, going and studying a master's degree. Before I studied that master's degree, I went and worked for the European Union. Uh, I was working with startups and young entrepreneurs working in the field of climate change, which we do know is a hot topic, um, no pun intended. Uh, but it's definitely something which is uh, prevalent and very much real. Uh, However, working with the European Union, I had a love-hate relationship with these large organizations who are talking about tackling climate change. But anyway, I think that's a whole podcast in itself. Uh, And so on on from that, I was actually traveling through Europe, lived in Paris, Munich, Zurich, Leuven in Austria, working with different young organizations. After that, I went and studied my master's, which was very interesting concept actually and you know this is a bit of a bit of a secret but i actually typed into google masters where i can travel and it was one of the top three because fundamentally the most important part for me was exploring the world there's a great quote which i will always sit with and it's to not travel is to only read the first page of your book and for me being able to travel and see the world was an incredible an incredible way to not only understand culture but I do believe we understand ourselves deeper through the eyes of others. And when you're, I lived in Taiwan, I lived in China, spent time in Japan, and it was just about, wow, what does this tell me about me? And what can I learn from others through that experience? And so I spent 18 months or so traveling through Europe, then through to Asia, and then finishing my master's 
out in California, in America, which was, as we know, is the mecca of tech companies and organizations. Uh, and that was the real big push for me. That North Star was always Silicon Valley. I definitely idolized it. I don't don't much anymore for various reasons. Um, I think California is a state and it and lots of America has a lot of extreme st extreme ends of the spectrum, you know, to to say the least. And th those experiences as well got me to where I am today. And so I'm ever grateful. But uh, I used to want to fantasize about living in America. And, you know, who's to say that I might not one day? But, you know, you've got Mission Street, just a small caveat of a story, Mission Street in San Francisco. And on one side of the road, you've got the Google HQ, you've got the inner city Uber HQ and Twitter. So you've got tech engineers walking out earning upwards of $200,000. Uh, and then on the other side of the street, in one view, you've got people who are homeless, all the way up the road and have been forced into the street because of how these tech companies have really started to create this large side of gentrification within the city. I believe innovation is necessary, innovation is vital, but I have no direct opinion on that like scenario, but it was just interesting. You know, you're in a city where you've got this abundant wealth coming from tech organizations, um, but then still a huge population of people who can't even afford food. So that was my, maybe America isn't the right place um, for me for now. Um, but actually having that experience now reinforces the work that I do. And so now to kind of lead off into the story um, around uh, I my relationship with myself and also then what happened to me health wise um but I, you know just out of interest have you traveled much neil yeah not as much or certainly not as much as you have um certainly the america thing i'm, I'm listening to with with you know really great interest i i do have a kind of like a love love relationship with america really to be fair um i do find as you do california really fascinating um those extremes you know the the characters the kind of the it's, it's a very i would describe it as a very colorful state um you have Ooh. every single color in in every definition you know the light the people literally everything is there it's almost like a microcosm of the earth really all in one place um but very very much drawn to arizona so a little to the Ooh. east of there um so uh, we we got married uh, in in arizona um wow. we spent some very very interesting times kind of on sort of self development uh, retreats mm -hmm. and things in arizona and mm. um, yeah feel kind of very very drawn to there so i think probably of all the places i've traveled to i would say that probably is it's almost like a spiritual home and uh, yeah, interesting. Absolutely. You kind you kind of find these, don't you? The more you do travel, you sort of think, yeah, I resonate with certain places more than others, and, and still hold that fascination. As I would say, really for California. But I do understand what you say about the. Uh, mm, yes, it's an acquired taste at times, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. No, and I um I definitely agree with that. And Arizona sounds amazing, and I've never actually been to Arizona. And I think what I've made sure that I do is not is not amplify my experience of one state across all the states and even just my very short experience of being somewhere i think uh just making sure not generalize as well and that's important um, but america is so big and there's such a spectrum and you mentioned things like self-development and in absolute non-negotiable kind of uh setting america has led the way with the world of self-development spiritual self-development in regards to all the writers and authors and and now retreats and wellness spaces that are met like they lead the way and you know they're they're many years ahead and something that really has fascinated me is their world of plant medicine and how they utilize things like plant medicine in therapeutic and wellness-based settings to help accelerate the mind and the body and how tech entrepreneurs hand in hand with being in the world of tech are exploring the metaphysical world you know steve jobs will remind us in his book uh, that one of the top three things that changed his life was his lsd experience out in the californian outback and so what that relationship with psychedelics and with the world of technology and with the world of mind is once again a very interesting topic i think which maybe can be explored 
at another time but we caveat um the story of myself so on on par after i finished my master's degree uh, i actually had a bit of a low point um i'd been studying for about five years and i'd been traveling all over the world and seeing all these great places and then i was like what the heck do i want to do with myself one of those you know the young person dilemmas which is a present dilemma and definitely is still very prevalent and raw and visual in our society i think the pandemic only accelerated that kind of seeking for purpose which i'll kind of go on to talk about the work i do now around that but there was definitely this sense of mm, so much opportunity but with that what do i want to do and where do i want to go and what happened to me is fortunate in a way as unfortunate as it was for those around me it was a real steering peg for getting to me getting me to this location now and so i'd ended my masters in around august 2019 and i then had got a call from the european union because i'd still kept in touch with them and i'd agreed to find a way to continue doing some work with them out, out in budapest in hungary and so they'd agreed to sign me on for a three-month contract to go and work with some of the startups out there and then kind of see how it went and see how it would go i would not even begin that three-month contract because of what had happened to me and so i traveled to budapest i traveled to budapest actually in uh, on a train and uh, it feels irrelevant but it becomes more relevant as the story unfolds and so i traveled by a train from london to paris then from paris over to uh somewhere in germany and then from germany over to budapest and as i arrived to budapest uh it was a saturday i spent the sunday in a, the saturday in a spa one of those hungarian spas if you've if you've ever gone to budapest i can really recommend and uh, when you do go they've got these beautiful old roman baths and spas and they're really really great uh and and so I remember that on the Saturday and on the Sunday morning, uh, it was the first day of this networking experience. And I had turned up in the morning, it was a footballing mixer and everyone was warming up. I got to meet new people and it was very much, very chilled, relaxed. Let's just get to meet each other and play some football. Um, on this day, October the 13th, my life truly changed forever. And so what had happened was I'd arrived to this event completely happy as Larry, feeling good, feeling ready. And the last thing I remember from that Sunday was actually turning around and dropping to the floor. And what had happened was I'd suffered a ruptured aneurysm in my brain. And what that is, is when your brain fills with blood, it's kind of like an ulcer in the brain and it's an ex kind of a burst in one of the blood vessels that happens inside of the brain. So what happened was, as I turned around, I dropped to the floor, a medic ran over and quickly did a few tests on me and I was having a fit on the floor. And these medics did some tests and they were like, oh, he's having an asthma attack because on my record, I had asthma when I was a child and that's all they could kind of pinpoint it to in that given moment. And so once I'd once they'd done these checks, they then said, cool, we need to get him into the back of a hospital, get him in the back of an ambulance and send him to a hospital. They put me in the back of an ambulance and on the way to the hospital, the doctors were doing checks and they said, he's not having an asthma attack. His brain is actually filling with blood. We need to redirect this ambulance to the neurological hospital because this kid needs to go into the operating theatre. As I was on the way to the hospital, I was completely unconscious at this time. As you can imagine, phone calls were being made out to my family, my sisters, my mum, my brother, in order to get them over. And you know, the news was Leith had fallen to the ground, completely out the blue, and is now on his way to a neurological hospital. I can only imagine what that must have felt like for a mother to hear. And to this day, it still sits with me and and times she reminds me and so you know that emotion that she went through and that experience of trauma as well where very visceral bodily trauma and that kind of awareness around how news can impact us in such ways uh, but physically is kind of where the real the real downfall was so as i was on the way to the hospital i went straight into the operating theater and by this point my parent my mum was on her way over via the first flight out from London. And I went straight into the operating theater. And in the space of 24 hours, I had three operations on my brain. One operation, they went into my brain, they tried to stop the bleeding. They couldn't stop the bleeding. 
at this point, my mum had actually arrived. And I remember she telling me that the doctor walked out and said, we've got some paperwork for you. You need to sign this paperwork because this paperwork pretty much says we're going to try some more things. But if it doesn't work, he's not our responsibility. Once again, I can only imagine what that must feel like to hear that type of information. But she had faith. My mother is an incredibly faithful, belief-filled woman. And it was non-negotiable in her mind that I was pushing through. Um, back into the operating theatre, I went completely unconscious. And they put two pieces of metal in my head, something called a shunt and then something called a stent. And not to go into the science of it, which I definitely dived into post experience because it is fascinating. Um, but a quick, quick insight. They went through my groin, up through my veins, into my brain, which is one of the most complex operations that you can actually have. And fortunately, we talk about the spirit, we talk about spirituality, uh, but talk about serendipity in a more scientific perspective. Dr. Istvan Sakura is one of the leading neurosurgeons who actually went and operated on my head. And he was in Budapest on that day. He's a Hungarian doctor. I was incredibly fortunate. He's not many people can actually do that operation and successfully. I then obviously spent the following seven days uh, in a medically induced coma. So Sunday the 13th, I dropped. Sunday the 20th, I woke up. On Sunday the 20th of October, I woke up disorientated beyond belief in a Hungarian hospital with no hair on my head because they had to shave it all off. And due to the operation on the brain, one of the side kind of effects of operating on the brain and working with the blood vessels is the chance of a stroke. So the cherry on the top was I actually also experienced a stroke. And so when I woke up, I had near to no feeling on the whole right side of my body. And as you can imagine, I was absolutely scared shitless because I didn't know what the hell had happened and I didn't know how I was going to recover. But the story is obviously a fortunate one because we are here now, very mobile. Um, but as I woke up, I, I, the doctor looked at me and he said, we're really happy you're awake, but we're unsure whether you'll ever move that right side of your body again. And you know what, Neil, there's a part of me that knew that that was not true. There was something inside of me that said, that's not my reality. My reality is not being in a wheelchair. My reality is not being on crutches. And then I, you know, I ring all the way back to the books I was reading at 16, 17, 18, around mindset, around belief. And this was the opportunity to say, oh, you've read these books. All right, let's see what you've got. Let's see what you've got then. Hey, let's put your, let's put the theory into practice. And I remember this real sheer moment of my dad who'd flown in. My dad lived in Iraq at the time. He'd flown in from Iraq um, to be with me in the hospital bed. And he put his hand on my knee and he said, Leif, I want you to dream your wildest dreams. I was like, Dad, what do you mean? He said, Leif, I want you to visualize everything that you'd love to do. Running, swimming, cycling. I'd love you to visualize everything that you love to do. And I said, why? He said, well, if you can believe it in your brain, you can actually instigate neurological connections, which actually restart the brain and kind of trick the brain into experiencing different things. Kind of like when we're watching a horror movie and we're getting really scared, but actually we're just in our living room, not in a haunted house. It's that same experience of Visual stimuli has an effect on our psyche, which allows us to feel certain emotions, which can then start to reprogram the neurological connections, which is a fascinating phenomena. And it's actually a huge field of research called epigenetics. And for the listeners and for yourself, Dr. Joe Dispenza is one of the leading uh, doctors in this space. And that nodding feels like you've kind of read some of his work. And that's amazing. And he, he, without him knowing, was in, was uh, influential in my recovery, uh, without him absolutely knowing at all. Maybe one day I'll meet him, and I hope, actually, and I'll share that story with him. And so all this kind of psychological programming of moving and thinking about that 24 hours in a day, 
couldn't sleep that well was in an ICU ward where in the middle of the night people would get rushed in, doctors, ambulance, and it was very intense. Uh, but I spent four weeks in a Hungarian hospital. During those four weeks, I worked with a local physiotherapist. I went from lying in the hospital bed to being on a Zimmer frame, to being on crutches, to at the end of that four week, I was hobbling out of that Hungarian hospital on the way back to Queen's Square in London. The doctors were absolutely shell-shocked and whether it was the visualization, the belief, the family love around me, the support, who knows, all those things are a recipe for success. But there was one thing I was certain and it was I was bel my belief in myself and the drive that I had to move my body and make sure that I lived the life that I wanted to live was the most important thing. And there's something that I'll always sit with and I kind of love to share at this point of the story. It was, I remember waking up in that hospital bed and seeing my friends and family around me. Neil, the biggest realization was I could have had the biggest car, the biggest house and the, the best job in the world. The most important thing was having those that I loved around me. To this day, it is my North Star. To this day, community, tribe, family and friends are the people that I value the most. The greatest medicine in the world for me, especially in that moment and ongoing. And so I went back to the Queen's Square Hospital in London and I spent a following two weeks in a deeper state of recovery there, still focusing on my mobility. After six weeks, I was discharged from hospital. And then, you know, I can then go on to explain kind of what, what happened afterwards and kind of the world that I'm in now. But I, you know, feel like taking a pause in the, in the story there just to kind of see how that's kind of landing. If there was anything that felt good to maybe explore more. I mean, it doesn't um, take me to say what a fascinating and, and such a, a motivational story that is. And yeah, I mean, you'll, you'll have heard that many, many times. So I'm not going to kind of need to go there, I think. But to me, one of the really, really interesting things I'd really kind of like to explore here is this kind of, I guess, motivation within you or is it a clarity within you that allowed you to make that decision and yes I am quite familiar with um, Joe Dispenza's work and in epigenetics we uh, so my wife um, Sonia and I went to uh, a conference of his um, literally wow. just before the the first lockdown I think it was um, sort of early 2019 and um, yeah it's it's I've, people haven't heard of this work it is absolutely mind-blowing it's not fascinating it's mind-blowing literally what can be achieved through the power of thought and mind and I guess kind of determination and clarity because listening to your story it feels from from my perspective as though there's possibly something a little bit different about the way that you kind of constructed that opportunity because it kind of feels, when you tell the story, it feels as though there's a question mark as to whether everybody could do that. I, I'm interested in your take as to whether you think that's something that was always kind of almost this innate potential within you to kind of overcome that sort of adversity. Or is it something, do you think, that could be trained, that everybody could possibly do? Mm, I really enjoy that question. Thank you, Nian going to one of Dr. Joe Dispenza's conferences must have been absolutely incredible and yeah amazing and so it's such a great question and to be honest it's I've sat with it for a while and the work that I do now around somatic practicing and somatic experiencing and mindset is trying to answer that question really it's trying to answer the question of can anyone have the tools that allow them to achieve more? Can anyone from any walk of life with the right facilitator, space holder and timing be equipped with practices, processes and frameworks, both mental and physical, that allow them to achieve greatness? And 
that is going to be the topic of my PhD research because it is inevitable that there's going to be a spectrum of experience because we're all different and we are all greater than the sum of our own parts but we are all fragments of the puzzle that makes us and so if I hadn't have got kicked out of school I would have never found entrepreneurship if I hadn't have found that I would have never explored the world of mindset and all these incredible writers who speak about their relationship with reality and the universe, things like The Secret. Then lying in the hospital bed, I wouldn't have had that basis for, okay, there's more here. Steve Jobs, who I've mentioned twice now, interestingly, I think it's because you've got a bit of a Steve Jobs look to you, Neil. Um, <laughs> so yeah, but he he has a great quote. You can't connect the dots looking forward, but you can connect the dots looking back. So when I look back and I look at those connecting the dots, every single experience that I'd had to getting the train and not flying, because where the aneurysm was in my brain, if I had flown within those days before, I wouldn't be here sharing the story because the pressure would have caused it to rupture early. And when you're 30,000 feet in the air, you're not that close to hospital. And so when I look back, I believe that it was meant to be, whatever that means. Maybe that it's the gift that I'm here to share this story. Maybe this story was my gift to others. And I hold that dearly and I hold that, that, that chalice of insight and it feels like a gift to share. But in, you know, to circle back round to your question, I feel like I would like to believe that, yes, everyone has a level of capability. Everyone has a level of greatness that they can tap into. And the work that I do now is a real spectrum of uh, different type of work. It's, it's with individuals, organizations and teams but then also working with understanding different types of spirit, our relationship to spirit, our relationship to the universe, our relationship to energy. And, you know, Nicholas Tesla said, if you want to understand the world, you must understand energy. And when we talk about energy and we talk about emotion, energy emotion in motion you know energy is emotion there's something around energy and emotion and allowing us to feel so emotion is energy in motion that's it and when we feel certain feelings how we sh how we direct these feelings and how we actually drive from that place of belief can completely shape our reality and our dna and Dr. Joe Dispenza, one of, alongside some other researchers, have scientifically proven that with lots of amazing data. And so in answer kind of to your question, I do think, yes, I do think that maybe my journey was as it was because of this gift of sharing. But I do believe that everyone can tap into it maybe at different levels of depth and different degrees of intensity. But I do strongly believe that by clearing the way, which is what I do with somatic practices and different types of modalities, we can tap into source energy. And by tapping into source energy, we can channel different forces far beyond our own belief far beyond even the work that I do and even beyond my own belief I do believe there's so much so much untapped there but for me the key is how do you clear the way how do we clear programming and sometimes that's generational programming and absolute generations of trauma and layers how do we remove that in order to shed in order to clear to allow individuals to really tap into that potential. When you when you talk about somatic, and as I guess for quite a lot of people, this is going to be a new 
kind of definition, new concept. And when you talk about somatic approach to kind of self-understanding and self-development, that word soma is is a Greek word from my understanding. It's uh, so it kind of means sort of holistic and, and kind of embodying almost everything. Do, do you feel that that really was the calling, the fact that with something like a somatic approach, so this very kind of holistic body, mind, soul, kind of you know one entity kind of approach was actually your calling because it feels like then by taking that kind of somatic approach you are applicable to absolutely everybody because if somebody has a a preference for feeling for example then you have got the tools within the somatic approach to you know kind of work with them on a feeling basis but if they're more of a thinking person i'm using kind of myers briggs analogy here but if they're more of a thinking kind of person then again you've got them there within the mindset space so it was almost like somatic is your kind of key to communicating with the broadest range of people you could possibly do and if you'd selected maybe one approach or one discipline you kind of maybe were restricting yourself so was, was that a conscious thing to go down the somatic embracing everyone and everything angle Ooh. because it kind of feels like that would work yeah do you know what no i've never seen it like that until you've just said that so it's been amazing to hear it and have that reflected back and i it well it wasn't intentional and it was very very connected to my own recovery and actually the world of somatics is something which it's kind of the built was the building blocks that I went through to get to where I am. So for example, uh, during that recovery journey, I dived into everything. Honestly, whatever you can imagine in regards to holistic practices, like I needed to try because when I was discharged out of hospital, I was in a very, very discombobulated is the right word, state of being. It was intense agonizing pain in my head. At some points, I was on 16 painkillers a day. I could barely move out of bed. So yes, I could. Phys- I was physically getting stronger, but actually, I was still very, very, very wounded emotionally and mentally. So I looked at myself and I said, well, physically, I need to recover. Emotionally, I need to recover. And mentally, I need to recover. And so I tried to tackle each of those things with completely different approaches. So when I was at home, the mindset stuff was something which I was quite well versed in, but started to read more around understanding the mind and understanding this world of epigenetics. And that was kind of the key around things around the mind. When it came to movement, I dived into my yoga practice much deeper. I'd been practicing yoga before kind of on and off. It's ritual for me now, daily basis and yoga sara and understanding the yogic way of being, the yogic way of life is far more than just the movement. You know, it's the relationship with our body, with our mind. And actually, how does yoga allow us to tune in deeper to ourselves through deep mindfulness and meditation practices? So that was big. I also explored the field of breath work and actually became a certified breath work practitioner. And that was a big flip. I'm sure you've heard of Wim Hof. Uh, You might have explored some of his work. It's good, good, good to know. And, you know, he was someone who was all about the ice and the and the cold and the breathing. And that was huge. You know, I'm a religious cold shower goer and cold water swimmer uh, on a very regular basis. I cold shower every day and cold swim when I can. And I do a daily breath work practice as well. So I knew that by doing these different practices on a daily basis, it would allow me to get a better understanding of the mind and activation as well. I then dived into the field of nutrition, and that was something which I'm still very explorative in. I've been plant-based, fully plant-based for around five years. I was the, I don't know what your dietary preference is, but I was the vegan who would bash you at the dinner table for eating meat. And that was a part of my character, which, you know, was definitely more based around the ego and actually not that, uh, not that from my own perception now, wasn't the right approach with being a being any type of dietary suited I feel like it's important to accept people as they are as we're all different um but I've been vegan for five years and you know it was non-negotiable uh that I would 
um, ever eat meat again. But that experience of what happened to my health, it was the most important thing was my well-being at that point. So suddenly I realized that while my diet needed to change, I needed to feed my brain. I needed to feed every cell in my body whole natural foods and very organic where possible. And so my diet completely shifted. <clears throat> Excuse me. My diet completely shifted in a way that was away from pretty much any type of processed or factory made good to complete whole foods and as close to the earth as possible. So, you know, I had steak for dinner last night. That's from a farm down in North Somerset. It's, you know, my relationship with food is very important. Um, and so those were like the big keys. It was, you know, that doesn't necessarily um, fit into kind of the field of somatic practicing, but food was very important. Um, and I kind of mention it just to share about how that whole journey was understanding different practices. And at the time I was getting Reiki, which I'd never done before. I was working with an acupuncturist. I was getting cupping done. I kind of wanted to throw everything out at it. And I've actually written a really great um, blog on my website around all the different practices that I tried, my experiences with them, and also kind of superfoods. And a big thing that really helped my recovery and whether I can kind of coin it to this is there's a great documentary called Fantastic Fungi by Dr. Paul Stamet. And it talks all around medicinal mushrooms, not the ones that, you know, make you see things, the ones that actually are medicinal. So lion's mane, turkey tail, ricea, chaga, ones you can pick up in a health food store. Those mushrooms became daily supplements for me to this day. And the studies around those mushrooms is absolutely phenomenal. And kind of one of my biggest kind of um, recommendations to anyone is go explore that world of mushrooms. And I've written another article all around medicinal mushrooms and, you know, the different benefits of medicinal mushrooms, the research behind them. And so as you can see, you know, it was a real spectrum to what books am I reading? to what am I eating, to how am I moving, how am I talking to myself, and most importantly, how am I breathing as well? How does my breath practice uh, instigate and help that recovery move? So with that all in mind, that kind of then built to this place of somatics and somatic experiencing, using different practices. And for me now, and something that you very nicely reflected back, is it means that it's open and accessible to everyone and anyone. Uh, I still feel we're quite early in the field. There's not that many, not that much, you know, when you compare it to different areas of research, like cognitive behavioral therapy or to yoga, as like modalities, like somatic experiencing is still very, still very early, uh, which is a gift as well, because my business mind, uh, and also my kind of wanting and desire to share this knowledge more is still early. And I feel like once I can start the research more throughout the next kind of five to six years in this field, hopefully it starts to have a really positive impact and a much wider impact with people all over. Mm. Quick shout out for the uh, the blog location for people who want to go there, uh, lathamshire.com. Um, um, and uh, the blog is uh, is going to be there on the website. So head over and have a look at that. Um, but in the meantime, I'm really, really interested and I've been waiting to see whether or not you use the word positive in, in any point in the description of both your experience, but also the way that you're kind of viewing the world. And I'm so encouraged that you've not yet said a thing about positive thinking. Mm. So to me, that this is not all about the kind of the rah, rah, oh, yes, you can do it, change your mindset kind of thing. This is all very, very grounded stuff. Is it So is your view, I'm going to, this is a bit of a leading question here, though, is your view to be much more about sort of clarity of thinking and, and clear thinking and grounded thinking and, you know, aware thinking rather than positive thinking, because it doesn't really feel that the words positive thinking really kind of resonated with your story at any point. 
<laughs> yeah, it's really, really great reflection, actually, and something that I think happened quite unconsciously, but subconsciously, because I've got a similar relationship with the word and the idea of like always being positive. Like, let me tell you something, like for me, like it's not always about being positive. It's about being cl clear and grounded and exactly what you're saying. And so, you know, I feel like I've learned that life is so tough, so tough, so difficult at times. And there's times where you just want to be angry and that actually being angry is important. And actually understanding your spectrum of emotions is so important. And actually, I feel like when we when we don't witness the emotion for what it truly is, we don't release it. When we don't release the emotion and we don't witness it, it stores in our body. When these emotions store in our body, we don't process it. When we don't process emotions, that causes trauma. And then trauma causes illness, both physical and mental. And so don't get me wrong, having a positive attitude to try and see the positives in experiences is important but being very rational and very real is something which I feel has suited me better and actually realizing that it's not all rainbows it's really 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 not and actually die doing the work that's allowed me to dive into my psyche I've seen some really dark stuff and that I've had to really to this day, work through shadows, work through the shadows of myself. And, you know, actually, it's, it's, you know, I circle back to a bit quick point around uh, big large organizations in the world of greenwashing, kind of there's a bit of positive washing, some things aren't all positive. And actually, we can't, we can't fool ourselves. We need to witness pain, suffering, the shadow self, the side of us that we don't want to look at in the mirror. Because it's only about doing that do we see the light. But what I've learned is the light of the bright, the brighter the light, the darker the shadow gets as well. And my sister, who's an incredible mentor and friend, uh, does a lot, a lot of work around mindset and she's published two books she's a sunday times bestseller actually she's an incredible uh an incredible woman and so she said late new levels new devils she said on this path the higher you go the more you have to deal with and that is a gift because the work that you do on the inside allows you to do greater work on the outside so when i'm deep in the rut deep in the emotions what pulls me through is acknowledging that by doing the work for myself, it allows me to do the work for others and hold the space for others to do that work as well. And so that's been an incredibly insightful uh, reflection and question because yes, you know, negative and positive are just perceptions. Everything just is how we approach those, how we use those experiences to shape our life is still our choice and there's a gift that we have uh, and so it feels like yeah it was a really lovely reflection around that and I definitely feel like I am as grounded as I could be but I have to continually check in with myself as well around that because I still have a lot of shadow to deal with <laughs> Don't we all? Don't we all yeah. get there? And I think for me, what I'd like to do just with one final question, just kind of circle back round to something you said right at the start, which was that, um, and I'll paraphrase this, but some of the best insights that you've had for yourself have been the reflections from others. And I, I don't kind of say that 
you know, in, in quite the way that you eloquently put it. But I think for me, this is all about when people are kind of starting to go on this journey of sort of self-reflection, building a little bit more self-awareness, um, taking time out and not being that, oh, give me the solution, fix me, because it, this takes investment. I mean, you're on a lifetime journey here of self-development and, and self-exploration, aren't you? And I think this is where the real value of this stuff comes is when people are willing to take the time to explore and to develop. But my question, that's a bit of a, a muse there, but the question really that I have for you is just going back to that point of, you know, to, to maintain the momentum for, you know, this whole somatic view of the world or, you know, be looking at, you know, really finding where I can find those kind of self-learnings. How much of this would you say can come from the reflections of others? In other words, actually listening to the feedback of others rather than just going on this kind of inward journey of self-exploration. Do you feel that there really is a, a real value in terms of kind of listening to the feedback of others, how others are perceiving you, um, you know, maybe just uncovering if it's the Jahari window, which again, if you've never come across this, um, listeners, have a little uh, search of that because this is really interesting one is it, it's the kind of unknown unknowns it's the thing that you can't see and others can't see but maybe working together and having those deep conversations can kind of uncover some of those things that otherwise you'd never really encounter mm. how, how much kind of of this self-development journey do you think is appropriate to be involving others or is it kind of more self ah what a lovely lovely question and it's it's really, really, really beautifully put, Neil, and it's, I think that relationship with ourselves, we learn about ourselves through the reflection of others. I feel there's time and space for both. It's not either or, it's both and. Having time in solitude to really reflect on our own self, sit with our own emotions. How do I feel? And what does that mean for me? Whilst inviting the space for others to share how they feel about us. It's always the difficult conversations that we shy away from the most that actually give us the greatest medicine. It's always those conversations that we're not willing to have that actually can teach us more about ourselves than we might believe. It's those conversations with those we love, those we really care about, those triggers that trigger us. And by triggering us, allow us to learn more about ourselves. And a lot of the work I do in teams is based around this. You need to speak to each other about how you feel. And you need to get out whatever you've put under that rug and put it on the table and deal with it. Because if you don't, where that may lead is going to be far more detrimental than if you just have this one difficult conversation right now. And actually having that and being willing to have those difficult conversations, internal processes is the work. And that is hard. And even providing safe spaces. So I facilitate men's circles in Bristol where we provide men's experiences for men of all ages, backgrounds to come together and share. And actually just having a space to share is invaluable. Having a safe container that is held where you just want someone to listen to you. And sometimes they don't need to respond. And actually, in most men's circles, we don't invite a response. We just invite brothers to be heard. And sometimes that's enough. So it kind of circles back round to your kind of, do we need others? Yes, and sometimes we need just someone to listen whilst we share. And I've kind of been sitting with this recently. We're all projecting. All we're ever doing is projecting our own experiences out into the world. So even if 
Joe Blog says something to me, how I respond will always be my projection. But actually, how do I just hold the space for them to share? Know that they feel heard and know that they are, it always comes back to loved and feel loved can sometimes be the greatest medicine that someone needs. So yeah, both and in answer to your question. No, so eloquent. Well, as this whole conversation has been absolutely fascinating. And I think for me, what I want to do now is make sure that people can connect with you, um, because I have no doubt at all that a significant number of people listening and watching this will be thinking, mm, I need to find out more about this somatic coaching. I need to find out more about Laith. I need to kind of just start exploring this because it feels like there's so much in here. How do people contact you? Sure. Great. Thanks, Neil. So most um, best way, I guess it depends what people uh, prefer. I've got a website, www.laithhampshire.com. Uh, maybe that can go in the podcast notes. Uh, I've also got an Instagram, which tends to be my main channel at the moment. It's at Laith Hampshire. Uh, I've also got a LinkedIn, which is Laith Hampshire. And I've also got an email, which is hello at Laith. Hampshire so tend to be around the place um, you can also just chuck my name into Google there don't there isn't many late Hampshire's uh, I've never met another one so it's it's there's if you want to find me there's a way I don't hide <laughs> and if it's meant to be it is definitely meant to be isn't it that's the thing as we've exactly. said it's been absolutely fascinating thank you so much for your insights your story your kind of wisdom and uh, and you're widely read aren't you you really are so you know i think people just need to connect with you just to get those kind of insights and those directional kind of next steps on the journey which i guess is is all we can hope for isn't it you know helping and encouraging people along their own journeys which is really what this is all about so thank you so much for your time today Laith. it's been absolutely really brilliant Thank you very much, Neil. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much.